welcome to Let's Talk Humanitarian, Parlons Humanitaire, enriching conversations with humanitarian leaders and humanitarian workers to open eyes, hearts, and minds. This is a program by Kalyu Institute, your online humanitarian aid study center, where humanitarians train humanitarians. My name is Amelie Yanguifes, and I'm honored to be your host for this conversation with Andrew Harper. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Moi. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. And before we start into a conversation that I'm, I believe is going to be really rich and enriching, I'm going to present you briefly, briefly well, this long career of yours and uh, in major humanitarian crisis. So, Andrew, you are currently the speci special advisor on climate action to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, known as UNHCR, in Geneva. You're responsible, and you're going to tell us a little more about this role later, but you're responsible for providing strategic guidance, oversight, and expertise to shape UNHCR's response to the climate emergency. Prior to this uh, current task, you were the director of the Division of Program Support and Management, DPSM, where you oversaw program policy, planning, management, as well as technical support to field operations. You hope you've also led the innovation service in UNHCR, and and, um, and we will want to know a little more about that, about innovation in humanitarian aid. You were responsible for leading and coordinating the international response to the Syrian crisis in Jordan. Some of the main achievements um, included the largest refugee, uh, well, managing um, the largest refugee crisis in the world and the establishment of the Zaatari and Azraq refugee camps, introducing biometric registration and linking that to the world's largest biometric-based refugee cash assistance program. Andrew, you also served as the head of desk for UNHCR, covering Iraq situation, and you've been the emergency focal point for the Middle East and North Africa region for the Libyan crisis. You previously worked also for Australian Embassy in Turkey and OCHA and various field locations with UNHCR, Central and Southeast Asia, Western Balkans, Islamic Republic of Iran and Ukraine. So we can say um, a life really much dedicated to UNHCR. Yeah. yeah. It, al it also shows how old I am as well. <laughs> we, we, we don't get onto that topic. <laughs> so what, what makes you so passionate about your night here? Well, I think it's um, like if, you've, if, you, if you just sort of go through what you've said, and, and again, like it, one thing is you have to emphasise from the start, none of this is an individual. Everything is about working together with others. Uh -huh. well, um, all you can do is contribute to a much bigger effort because the issues out there are just so 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 huge that as soon as you start talking about individuals then you start sort of almost losing that the, the need for that holistic um, approach and I think one of the, the the key things which I love about my work is that you're always working in a team and it's not just for instance within UNHCR but it's also within the wider humanitarian uh, field but also the governments and most importantly the people on the ground and if you look at UNHCR's mandate, which is to provide protection and assistance to those people who are most vulnerable because of they've, they've had to flee from their, their homes, um, there's no better mandate than to, and, and I always sort of see the word protect as almost like a bit patronising, but like to work with people to, to find solutions for them, to uh -huh. um, find, find a way in which they can move forward um, and also to work with the host communities who are who are often neglected in when we're when we're talking about refugee mm. situations because without the host communities and the governments there wouldn't be a, a place of asylum so yeah. there has to be um you have to be passionate you have to be enthusiastic yeah. about what you do because you won't make a difference so um it's it's sort of hand in glove almost um if you're not passionate if you're not willing to sort of like be on the front lines um, and committed to be accountable too, because you have to take responsibility. You can't you can't be a bystander in these sort of situations. So that would be <laughs> some of the elements yes. of why, Thank why, you. I'm, why I'm passionate Thank about it. Beautiful. Thank you for starting and sharing with us your your, your passion and your uh, enthusiasm, energy, commitment, and that's so important. Yes, in 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 that work. So you've worked many years on the um, Syria crisis. 
and um, and you have uh, many insights to share with us. But uh, I mean, it could take us the whole day, and and that would be a delight to do that. But you don't have that time, and and uh, and um, I would like to ask uh, about the what we mentioned in the in your bio. It's the this biometric registration of um, of refugees. Can you tell us about how did it start? How did we link it to the bigger? picture and to the cash assistance program. Tell us more about this and, and what, what it has meant, not only for Syria, but in the bigger picture of the humanitarian world. Yeah, well, I think um, like biometrics has been around for some time, but uh, I don't think it was fully, let's say, grasped as a, an integral part of, of accountability for humanitarian systems. And I think when, when we start looking at um, like innovations or ways in which we can do things better, it's we, we can't sort of come in with an approach which is we've got the solution. You have to look around at what is available and build upon that. And in, in the case of Jordan, Jordan had a biometric system uh, which they're using at the airports as people were coming into uh -huh. and they would, they would be screened. So like, we were having 5,000 people crossing the border per night. And like that's a lot of people. That was basically we're having to mobilise 80 buses to move people from the barbed wire to the refugee camp. And we had to find a way in which we could streamline the process of registration. We weren't so much interested in getting the names right, or to get, but we wanted to make yeah. sure that we, had, we could identify the unique identity. And that, at a later point, we could then sort of catch up and get more details and information. But having that unique identity and then moving them into shelter was, was critically important, not only for us, but for, for also the Jordanian government, because how, how UNHCR works and how the UN works is based on trust and credibility. And what we wanted to demonstrate to the government was that we knew exactly who was coming into the country and we could uh -huh. link them up at a, at a later point. And it was quite interesting too, so that, um, so one, we used existing technology, which was in Jordan, but we, we brought it to scale. We did it in collaboration with the government, so they were, they were confident in what we were doing. But there was a lot of, um, let's say, scepticism from everyone who was saying the Syrians will not want to be registered using biometrics. They won't turn up. They won't, um, they won't want their details uh, taken into account. Basically, the next day, once we started and put out a broadcast saying that we, are, well, we want to register people using biometrics, we had 5,000 Syrians, 10,000 Syrians coming, lining up outside our offices being registered. They wanted to be registered. They wanted to be taken into account. They wanted to see that they were being, um, that there was, there was a degree of um, protection being put in place for them. Mm. So, um, so the issue was um, making sure that we had a streamlined system in place that we could be also accountable. And what it did lead to was um, increasing trust from the refugees as well as the government because we could say to the refugees that we want to make sure that the assistance that we're being that we're providing goes to the right person. Yeah. We're not we're not paying one person five times or six times, which which has hof, often happened in past situations where people would come in with with fraudulent documents. This time, you couldn't be having a fraudulent document because we were we were looking at the um, the digital information from your yeah. um, uh, scanning from your from your irises. So within um, let's say. A month or so, we were able to find that we were making savings of something like thirty percent in regards to our cash assistance and the distribution of non-food items like blankets, because we we're paying. So we we're providing the assistance that people d um, deserved <laughs> um, yes. once, and so that meant that there wasn't sort of like this um, black market of excess goods going around. And so after that, other agencies started piggybacking onto the system and it just started getting more and more um, engaged. And I think it, one of the positive things is it accelerated the um, involvement of the use of biometrics as a means to um, be accountable for not only the registration, but for the distribution of assistance. And that meant that governments were more trustworthy of UNHCR yeah. to provide that assistance because um, I, I, I was extremely confident that there was, I wouldn't say never any um, sort of diversion, but I, I was pr pretty confident that we were doing everything that we possibly could to be accountable for the resources that were entrusted to us.
why it, 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 I, I love hearing how the, the use of technology enabled us not only to, to be more efficient in the delivery of humanitarian aid and that people who need it get it absolutely and also um, for accountability, acceptance and ownership you know, by the, the, the hosts and uh, by the different I mean, I also, stakeholders. I if I can also add one more thing, um, which was also the resettlement side of things too, because uh -huh. uh, what we wanted to do was from the point that we registered a refugee and determined that they were in need of resettlement to the point of their departure, we knew it was the same person. Mm. And, and yeah. so at a time of increasing hesitance from resettlement countries to make sure that we were sending the right people, that was also um, really important that we had that trust uh, from the time the refugee arrived to the time they departed, that we could actually be 100% conf confident that it was the same person. Well, in, in, in how long did it take, I mean, to, 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 to get it um, functional? Well, well the, uh, again, like Jordan uh, was fantastic in regards to the fact that, they, that the system was developed in Jordan. It's been sold elsewhere around the world. Um, there was a very educated um, population within Jordan that we were able to tap into for, for our staff. We had something like 400 staff working. So to, when you have 5,000 people coming across the border per night, you need to have an yeah. equivalent infrastructure. Um, I think we, we had about 100 um, iris scanning sets um, with, in various offices. So it's, it's a, a huge logistical operation so that... You had to set up this infrastructure at the point where refugees entered, also at the refugee camp, and also in the major urban centres. So I'd say probably two months, maybe one month, two months. So it was pretty, mm. pretty quick. Wow. And, and pretty we, quick, yeah. And then we transfer because we also often people sort of see the UN or humanitarian agencies as like not necessarily um, at the cutting edge. We have to be not only at the cutting edge; we have to be ahead of the cutting edge. Yeah. <laughs> we we yeah, have show to, the way. Yeah. yeah we, we have to sort of try new ways of working uh, because lives are depending on it. And yeah. so we, we can't sort of spend a year or two years piloting and, and checking through the processes. We sometimes have to, um, let's say, push, push the initiative more than is generally accepted over. Yeah. I love that. And, 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 and you believe this uh, system that has been set up and this experience is easily exportable to, to other, other contexts? Um, yes, definitely. So the, um, but again, this is something which we established, was it 2014, 15? So it's like technology improves. Um, yeah. the, the system and thinking still is applicable. And the other like, very useful thing too was that if somebody was registered in Jordan, and then they moved to Egypt, it would take basically half a second for the operation in, in Egypt to find out that that person had been previously wow. registered in Jordan. And so we had, I know, I know what the teams, like our teams did a fantastic job because during the 2015, 2016 um, refugee influx into Europe, supposed influx into Europe, <laughs> Jordan had yeah. been yeah. as, as <laughs> Lebanon and everyone else, um, but the influx according to Europe. Um, the, uh, we had ministers and prime ministers coming from Europe and sort of saying, okay, like, why can't the EU do something similar? <laughs> like, why, 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 yeah. why can't we have a, bit, a, a good a system for registration and tracking assistance as what has been put in place in Jordan and subsequently in Lebanon and, and other locations. So, um, yeah, it can be, um, and, and you see how quickly technology is being developed and being used around the world. Like you, the computer that you've probably got now, maybe, uh, has probably got <laughs> some sort of biometric uh, system which you can open yeah. it with. So yeah. it, it's, it's more about um, how do you utilize not only utilising uh, technology for your own benefit, but what are the problems and challenges that you're being confronted with on a daily basis, and then then searching for that technology. So it's you, you're putting the problem and challenges up front, and then saying, okay, yeah. how are we going to resolve this? And so that, mm. that then sort of opens and broadens your horizon in relation to what can be the solutions that you're that you're after. And then you can start challenging people and sort of saying, oh, don't tell me the technology does not exist to solve this problem. Yeah. It, it's mainly the will. Um, sometimes it's the security um, element to it or regulations. But 
the needs are there, the technology is there, and I dare say the money is there. Um, you just have to try and link it all together. Mm. And and uh, that that that's a great transition to 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 a question I wanted to ask you about um, when you your times when you you led on innovation the innovation mm -hmm. department in your night year. So I guess technology is part of of um, of this innovation, but there's more to it. So tell us a little about. Uh, what was uh, what? What is your innovation for Unite here? Well, I think innovation is, and everyone has a is innovative to some extent because innovation yes. means looking, looking at doing things differently and doing things better. Um, I think what, and I must say that was probably my most favourite job in my entire career with UNHCR. The like just being able to think differently, uh -huh. working with working particularly with very young dynamic people who are sort of thinking, okay, like, why are we doing it this way? It doesn't make any sense. And, and because that's just the way the UN works, but like, we should, we should never accept things and say, this is how things should continue to work. We should always yeah. be challenging and saying, it doesn't make sense. Let's, let's try and look for something better. Um, so innovation means different things to different people. I, I just keep it very simple and say, let's, let's look at things, at doing things differently. Let's looking at doing things um, ground up, like asking the communities what are the challenges that they've got um, and trying to address them. And most importantly, having a, an impact. As soon as people start saying, we're going to have an innovation conference, <laughs> I'll just say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, there, is, there is so, like every year or two, you have a, a particular theme where everyone says, we need to have a conference. And then you have 30 conferences. Like that, innovation is not about conferences. Innovation is, is doing some things differently at the ground level and i think one thing which was um was particularly enlightening during let's say the 2016 2017 and beyond was that there was this fixation on providing apps in order to support refugees yeah. moving to europe that is not the approach what you need to do is look at what are the refugees using and what is the information that they they're looking for and so because you can you can look at um, an app, developing an app and it may or may not be used, but you can look at what is refugees um, using? Are they using WhatsApp? Are they using Signal? Are they using Facebook? And that way you then sort of, you're, take, you're taking note and you're reinforcing um, the key communication modules that, um, that refugees are using. So you're, you're working with them rather than forcing something which is top mm -hmm. down. So um, yeah, that's that's something which um, I think is particularly important is that you you look at the the context and you um, you work with that you, you you focus on the impact you focus on the timeliness um, and so some of the most important innovations are the, are the simplest ones. Yeah. So don't don't go too sophisticated. Don't go too technical. Um, don't think that everyone has got an Apple um, iPhone 12 in um, the Sahel. Like, what, yeah. what is it? So the transfer of funds, for instance, using um, mobile apps, MTN um, in East Africa, that's a great innovation. Empowering, uh, quick, anyway. Lots of things going. <laughs> Great, thank you so much uh, um, for, for sharing in this and, and especially uh, yes, giving us this, this advice about let's let's keep it sim uh, simple. It's about thinking differently and involving. And this is true because we all um, this is a true participation of of people when we look at what are their needs, what do they use. You know, and often in uh, our projects, we speak about participation of beneficiaries and, and we don't really know how it happens really. But what you've just mentioned and how you look at what they do, how they do it, and, um, and you build upon that to, to, to deliver better, um, a better humanitarian aid, then that makes uh, much more sense in terms of having people involved in what is meant for them. Um, can yes. I just say, because this is, I'm, I'm going to keep talking. Um, about <laughs> participation is really important too, because um, often what happens when people go to refugee settlements or urban environments and they look for participation, they take the ones who um, can speak English or who are very, let's say, alpha oriented. Uh -huh. like they, they, they're the first ones to step up. They may have linkages to the authorities. That's not what's important. What is important is going to what we'd say the back of the tent. Yeah. Like who are the who are the 
what about the situation of the elderly? What about the situation of um, the pregnant women, uh, conservative groups, indigenous groups? Um, like, take the time to go to the back of the tent, go to the furthest away, the mm. ones who do not want to speak and sort of say, why, like, what is the situation that you're facing? Yeah. And it's, it's only that, like, if you just go to a refugee camp or a refugee settlement or go to an NGO centre and just talk to the people who are working there, it, that's not necessarily reflective of where the true needs are. Yeah. I love your expression, go to the back of the tent. That's something that uh, we will keep. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I wanted um, to ask you about the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. Now you understand it's five years old. Um, can you tell us a, a little about what it is uh, for, for some people mm -hmm. maybe who are watching us and, and, and are not aware of, of it? And a little share with us what has happened in these five years, what has worked, what, uh, what, um, which impact uh, are, are you seeing and, and how are you going to continue and move forward with this uh, framework or, or what are the changes that are going to be made, adjustments? Okay, I think the... Um... Okay, it's a, it's a good point because it is five years ago, and um, you know, I think this week also demonstrates several um, several unfortunate anniversaries, including Yemen and Syria. Yeah. So, like, mm. so unfortunately, um, what the what the CRF um, result meant to achieve or is is achieving is a is a different way of working where it's not just focused on a refugee response, which is important. It's a much more comprehensive response. You're looking at the overall needs of the community, including most importantly the um, uh, the host community, and then radiating out to the region and to the country itself, and working much more in sync with in sync with um, development actors and peace building and security. So, so it's not just about UNHCR providing assistance and protection with NGOs. It's about how can we work towards a much more comprehensive framework, a much more comprehensive response so that um, our engagement also links in with the development needs of the community and so that we can also access or solicit much larger funding and support including from the uh -huh. world Bank. and i would say that's probably been one of the biggest successes that um, we have achieved is that um, we're working much closer with uh, development actors um, uh, the world bank uh, other international financial institutions also civil society as well, um, and the private sector. I think the private sector is also, yeah. I've actually got to do a presentation later today to um, yeah. the private sector. So the fact that we're much more engaged about um, that a refugee situation is not just a humanitarian situation, but it also links into development and peace building and security um, is critically important. What has happened after that as well has been that um, you've had the um, Global Compact on Refugees uh, which was accept, which was basically signed off by the General Assembly, and the um, Global Refugee Forum as well, which is aimed to dr to move forward beyond the the, um, the CRF and to start setting targets for uh, what engagement with the development sector and the private sector actually means. So I think that the fact that we are more more and more focused on not just refugee camps, but also supporting uh, the settlements is, is really important. Yeah, and um, I, I, I loved when you mentioned the private sector. Can you tell us a little more how the private sector is, is um, getting involved in? Um... Well, the, the private sector is, um, if, if, we, if we're serious about making a sustainable long-term difference, then Humanitarians are often sort of like very focused short term in, in our response because it's often limited to uh, humanitarian response. Then you have development actors who come in to support the government and um, infrastructure. But if you actually want to have something which is sustainable for the long term, you need to have it cost recovery. You need to have investments. You need to be looking at livelihoods that can continue to um, provide support for generations. Yeah. So it's, it's recognition that um, if you only look at a humanitarian or development uh, response, it's not going to lead really anywhere. You need to demonstrate that refugees and the host communities are also a market. Mm. So what is it that we um, can have a win-win situation? So I'll give you an example in um, northern Uganda in um, Bidi Bidi, where 
there was, let's say, 400,000 people crossed into the north of Uganda, and there was a, a major need for um, internet access because people wanted to be able to communicate. The, ch the challenge was that there's no, obviously no internet connectivity up there, yeah. but there was a demand. And so we, what would normally happen is that UNHCR, our partners, would, would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars putting up internet towers and paying for the security and the fuel and, the, and everything else. But then, but that's not that's not a sustainable option. Yeah. So what the team did, actually the innovation team, they actually went to um, our, with our colleagues in Kampala, went to the um, uh, the mobile network providers in Kampala and said, "We've got a business opportunity mm. for you." And so yeah. four four telecoms telecoms operators went up to Biddy Biddy, went, "Nah, <laughs> um, it's not viable." But then we then we facilitated a market survey. And the market survey said that people were going to spend a dollar fifty or two dollars per month on internet, and that then the companies basically did the maths in their mind and went, actually, that's a lot of money if you start talking about fifty to one hundred thousand families. And so all of a sudden, we had two or three companies move up to the north and provide internet uh, facilities, and they had a cost recovery within maybe six months or nine months from their initial investment. So, so that's the type of things which we, so we provided, we focused on the outcome, which was providing communication. Yeah. We didn't have to take responsibility of setting up the infrastructure and the communications fitted into the existing infrastructure of Uganda. So this is where um, yeah. it's, about, it's about empowering uh, rather than creating a dependency on, on populations. But then we've obviously got to work with the government to make sure they've got licenses and everything like that. But yeah. That's just an example. Wow, what, what an, an, a beautiful success story. Now I'm hearing sustainability, partnership, empowerment, and, and going back to normal, now to normal life. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, excellent. Well, yeah. Well, I think it's sort of like every, just put your, yourself in a position where that you're a refugee and yeah. you've got a family. Like all you want to do is to go back to a sense of normality. Yeah. Like, in this period of COVID, like it's like it's a it's a this is what we all want. Like we can yes, <laughs> we, 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 we as a species we're very adaptable. Mm. Like we prefer to be a place where we're uh, where we've originated from. But if we can't, just give us the means to move on with our lives and and with dignity, so that we can also yeah. contribute. Not only sort of provide support to our own families, but the communities that have also provided us with protection. Mm. I love what you've just mentioned, now that it's true in those times of COVID, we all of us have this uh, need, no? So let's see if we connect with this need of going back to something we knew, and, um, and that helps us to enhance our empathy, no? Uh, towards people who, who are, yes, going through many changes uh, due to conflict or other situations in their lives. So um, to, 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 to close, uh, to finalize this interview, and, and um, I, I would like that you tell us a little more about the, your, um, your role, your current role. So what is it, uh, uh, climate action in UNHCR? Uh, we, you, you sort of um, outlined it very well at the beginning. Um, like I can sort of go through the, the theory of it, providing strategic guidance and all that. But uh, uh -huh. what it basically means is that um, the biggest biggest threat that we all are facing at the moment is is climate um, yeah. and, it's, and the extreme climatic conditions that are going to increasingly prevail in every aspect of the world. And so as a refugee agency, as a protection agency, um, we have to increasingly be aware, cognizant of the fact that um, climate is going to be an increasing driver of forced displacement. So, so my role is not only to um, bring all the different elements involved with climate and environment and energy together within UNHCR, but I would say also raise the ambition mm -hmm. that, um, that we have to be increasingly prepared for, um, unfortunately, increased vulnerability of, of populations. So already there's three times as many people being uh, forced from their homes due to extreme weather event events linked to climate rather than conflict. So it's already yeah. um, the key driver. We're also finding that 90% uh, of refugees around the world originate from a country which is classed as either vulnerable or extremely vulnerable to climatic conditions. 
so it just makes sense that we're very much engaged um, in this in this area. So we've got a, we've got a strategic framework which we put together in the last um, twelve months, which is based on three pillars. The first one is to look at the doctrinal, legalistic uh, protection side, like what are the legal um, instruments available for people who have been forced to leave from their homes, and we're not looking to create new instruments. We're not looking to expand mandates, but we're trying to do a stock take um, of what applies. And thankfully, um, particularly in country, in regions such as Africa, we've got the OAU Convention, the Organization African Union Convention. They already take into account disasters, uh, disaster displacement as a as as a um, as a as an expanded definition for refugee status. Also in um, in Latin America as well, the Cartagena uh, Declaration. So, yeah. and this, the second element is how can we be doing a better job to reduce the impact. Of, on the environment in refugee locations? Uh, how can we reduce um, the, the reliance on biofuel, biomass? Um, how can we be much more um, environmentally savvy? So where we're putting our, our, our camps, uh, but also working with, with cities as well, which are particularly important because that's where the vast majority of refugees are located. And the third element, third pillar is, how can UNHCR do a better job? How can we reduce mm. the carbon? How can we, um, I think we've got about 4,000 diesel generators around the world. So why do we have diesel generators? Um, how can we start working, for instance, with the private sector to stop paying for diesel and start providing um, using photovoltaic cells? How can we mm. reduce the numbers of cars that we're using in the field? Maybe joining with other agencies. So again, questioning everything that we're currently doing and trying to make decisions based on um, being seen through an environmental lens. Mm. Thank you. So a lot of innovation I hear that will need to, to be, I mean, is part of, 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 of this role also in, in this, uh, this department. Thank you so much, Andrew, for all that. So as a final word, I, I have two small, uh, more personal questions. Um, I wanted to know, um, have you ever dreamt or considered doing something else? Um, well, I actually went to university to study forestry. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that so that was my um yeah so I, one of the one of the reasons why I might be so interested in the environment is that uh, I was I was very much interested in um, doing forestry when uh, when I first started university but then I then I transferred to economics um, but but after joining well, after being starting with in this sort of um, in the humanitarian world like there's just nothing which comes close to it. This has to be one of the best jobs in the world, yeah. particularly when you look at climate and refugees, like there is nothing more interesting and more pressing and more important. Yeah, yeah. And um, if uh, with all these years of experience, all these different contexts and, and all your passion, um, if you were to be give a piece of advice to our students of the Master on Humanitarian Aid, the Kalu students, what would be this one piece of advice you would like to share? I think, all, like, it, it may sound simple, but remain principled. Um, if, yeah. if there is an option between taking the easy way or the hard way, and the hard way is the right way, take that. Um, mm. Also, again, question the need for endless meetings. <laughs> question the yeah. need for why does a meeting have to be for an hour? Why do you have to sort of like focus on um, process? Like mm. we have to be, we have to be um, like the most important element is impact. So if you're working in humanitarian field, you should not be responding or setting yourself to account to your boss or to your supervisor or to your donor. Your chief person is the person on the ground who's relying upon you. I remember when I first joined UNHCR that there was a, which was many years ago, there was a, there was a slogan which was says, um, the voice for the voiceless. Uh -huh. That really has to be the focus. Like yeah. if we were talking to um, a refugee, would we be proud of what we've, we're doing mm. or not? And I think there was, um, I remember when like in some of the emergencies that not only I've been involved in, but obviously, my colleagues are still much involved in you would you'd be sort of working on the weekends and you'd be trying to contact somebody in headquarters and they've taken the weekend off <laughs> like they were yeah. like in the field you don't like you work when because refugees don't have a weekend off 
They're refugees. Mm. So you, having this mindset of, um, of being accountable and responsible, or responsible again is a bit paternalistic, but sort of um, you, you have an obligation um, to be front and center with the people that, that are there on the front lines. Yeah, okay. Thank you for this inspiration. Thank you for your time, for all what you shared with us in terms of knowledge and, and this commitment that is contagious. So thank you very much, Andrew, for this time with us. Thank you for your time too. Thank you for the interest. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Andrew.